for um, this session is Lauren Sager Weinstein, Chief Data Officer at Transport for London. Uh, she will present delivering better transport with big data. Lauren is responsible for driving decision making and improved customer services through provision of data products and services. Uh, she oversees Transport for London's business intelligence, data science strategy, data technical platform development, as well as support for data products and services. Please welcome Lauren. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. What I wanted to do today is talk to you not from a technical perspective, but really from a business perspective about why do we invest in data, why do we use data, how do we think about making it useful? And so my pre presentation today will be really to that aim. Happy to talk about some of the technical uh, decisions we've taken as well, but my strong view is that any time we're thinking about how do you use data and how do you invest in it, how do you make a case for it, it's got to come back to the reason why. And the reason has to be about what your purpose is as an organization. <coughs> so now, at TFL, no doubt, um, all of you touched our services in some way today. Um, and we, you'll see from the data, we have loads of data. I'll talk to you about all that fantastic data that we get. But we have to start from the perspective of saying, why are we here? What is our aim and what is our purpose? And this is, this is information that we use, and when I talk at events and externally, but we also use it internally to make sure that we're all on the same page about what, what we're doing and why we're here. What's our purpose? And Transport for London's purpose is to deliver for the mayor and to deliver the mayor's transport strategies, aims, and objectives. And that means we have to make sure that we're keeping London working uh, and growing and make life in London better for Londoners. And to do that, we need to think about all of our journeys on the network. And this is, again, where the sort of data is fantastic because it really unlocks the potential for understanding this. But we say every journey matters, and we mean it, and we can use data to really understand all the different varieties of journeys on our network. And the other important thing we need to keep in mind is that we need to be clear on what our customers want and expect from us. Um, they, they need to understand what we stand for and why we are, why we are in existence and what we're, what we're going to do and how we're going to support their aims and their needs in terms of mobility in London. And they also specifically then uh, want to make sure that they understand, that we understand that what they want. And they want a strong, reliable service um, and a strong customer experience. They want to have value for money, um, and in terms of understanding how we invest the fair money that we take in from our customers, making sure that we're providing services back to our customers. And they also want to see progress and innovation. Um, they're expecting that we sort of think ahead and think about how we can deliver better, uh, more effectively, and push ahead with technology to help us do that. And then underpinning this all, and this is absolutely crucial, um, and particularly when we think about data, they, they need to uh, trust us. And so it is fundamental that we preserve and we protect the trust and we maintain that trust that our customers have. And it absolutely underpins everything that we do. And so therefore, um, before we get into some of the details of how we're doing uh, our data analysis, we start from understanding that personal data is very important for us to safeguard and protect. Um, it is fundamental, and I just cannot emphasize this enough, that we, are, we are, that we are absolutely protecting our customers' personal data. They're trusting in us and they're giving it to us. So we need to be very clear about what we're doing with our customers' data, and we are transparent about how we collect the data, um, and we have a way, the way that we do this is that at the point of data collection, we tell our customers, um, and we have further information so they can go to our website and they can see um, the details. So this is what we call a sort of a, a layered approach to privacy where we have, um, at point of collection, we'll give a little bit of information, but of course, as we understand, a customer is traveling across the network, they won't necessarily um, have the time to stop and see the full extent of it, but we inform them at the point of collection. And then we have a very detailed website, and I would recommend that, um, that you go and you take a look at our privacy pages on the website that explains about the data that we collect and what we, how we sort of use that data. And then the other thing that's important is that when there's a new data initiative, and you'll see this in some of the data initiatives we've done, um, we do, we spend a lot of time at the outset thinking about privacy. Um, and so we do a privacy impact assessment at the start of, the, of a project that involves personal data. And we work, to do this, we work closely with our data protection teams, and we rely upon guidance from the Information Commissioner's Office. 
And then lastly, we do have a few um, academic partners, and I'll mention some of this, some of them in the uh, uh, examples that we that I mentioned later. And for our partners who are working with us, we also make sure that they understand and treat our data um, appropriately and, and control and, and in terms of how they are using the data. And then we give them pseudonymized data. Um, and, but that pseudonymized data is sensitive data, and we ensure that they are treating this uh, data protection seriously as well. Um, so this gets to the fun data part. And as a data geek, I love this part, which is when we think about all the data that we collect on a given day. We're really data rich. Because we're providing services on the public transport network and on the roads network every day as we run our services and run our trains and run buses and run traffic lights, we collect all this data. And the opportunity is how do we take the data that we're autom automatically collecting and make it useful? So what do we collect? We have on a given day 19 million smart car ticketing transactions. Um, we have AMPR registration plates from 1,600 cameras on our road network. And we have what we have called iBus geolocation events, which is where, where buses are at um, into within the sort of sub-seconds, and we can sort of gather information about where our buses are, whether they're opening doors, um, how they're traveling on our network. And then we have um, train data. And so we have diagnostic data, which comes out of our trains, particularly the newer trains, can give us very rich data in terms of um, how our trains are running, how they're braking, how heavy they are. And that's hugely sort of helpful for us as well, and where they are on the network. Um, so it's great. It's fantastic. But data itself isn't enough. It's kind of pointless if we're not going to do something valuable and useful with it. And that's not just monitoring and answering questions, because that's really interesting. And again, for those of us who love data, it's fantastic. But unless we can actually turn this into things that we will do differently, improving our services, making better decisions on how we plan and operate our network, giving information back to our customers, that's, it's only then where the data is going to be useful and valuable, and we can make an, an investment decision about investing and doing more with our data. So, in the decisions of what are we going to do with our data, we want to make sure we're going back to what do we stand for, what are our priorities. And a few of them are, are here, which is putting the customers at the heart of what we're doing. It's fundamental. Um, improving operations and safety and supporting capacity and growth. And so some of the examples that I'll talk about will re are really to focused on doing this and delivering this with data. So one of the, so the first examples I wanted to talk to you about today is how we take um, ticketing data and gather trends and information from it and depersonalize it and look for patterns and then understand what's happening on the network. And so this is where we can take um, sort of Oyster card and contactless data and build a profile of customers traveling at different stations at different times. And we've been doing this actually for, for quite a while. And we um, are looking at how busy our network is and explaining to our customers busy times. We're looking at how to give customers information where they want to see it. So some of it is things that we have done at stations. And you may have seen some of our posters um, at stations saying this is a particularly busy time at this particular station on our website. And then we also have customers who want a personalized relationship with us. So they opt in to get service messages from us. And for these customers, we understand their travel patterns, and we give them useful information based on their travel. Um, we, what, they, what people do is they opt in to share information about uh, their, their sort of own um, sort of ticketing information. So they'll give us their Oyster card or contactless payment uh, cards, names, and, then, and their emails. And then we can provide information back to them so that they can see relevant information for them. And I get every single email we send out, and I can tell you, there are loads of them. So our challenge is to make sure we're giving useful and, and helpful information to our customers. And that's where we've done a lot of work about identifying um, customer patterns and information back to customers where that would be useful. And so then, another example is where we've done some, some really sort of interesting work on um, taking, uh, taking data patterns and depersonalizing this. Um, and just say, seeing if you can understand how there are different customer types on the network without knowing anything about customers at all. All you know is sort of entry and exit taps. And this is a case where we have looked at different customer patterns based on different travel on the network. And you start from a premise that says, well, we know that ne the network is very busy. If you go back to the previous slides, you can sort of see very busy times of day. 
And before we did this analysis, we didn't know exactly how it was busy, because if you're standing up from a bird's eye view, you know it's busy, and you see people there day after day after day. But it's not the same people day after day after day. And you can see very clearly, again, all you, know, all you need is just sort of the records of pseudonymized, so scrambled tap data, um, but consistently scrambled over a period of time. And you can see their different customer types. So you can see a type of the, sort of this group um, on sort of one side as sort of very regular users who are traveling from home generally to a, we, uh, we would assume a place of work, um, and back home again. And there's a very regular pattern of certain types of our customers. It's not every single day, and what you'll certainly find is that some days people will leave a little bit later or leave a little bit earlier, so there's some variability. But you have a number of what we would consider sort of regular users of the system. But then you can contrast that um, with some sort of customers whose patterns are very, very, they may be using the system really, really intensely, but the actual sort of patterns of journeys, um, there's just so many places they're traveling. Sometimes you can see sort of a standard pattern for parts of the day, sometimes you don't even see that. And that really helps us understand the types of users in our system. We can also see visitors. So we can sort of see where you have sort of a car that will show up in, in intensely for a few days at particular sort of stations, primarily in sort of the central, uh, central London in Zone 1, where there's a lot of tourist sites, and then disappear again. And, you, and by understanding the different customer types at different stations, and they all have slightly different profiles, that helps us understand the, our individual stations and think about planning signage, um, planning different sort of customer amenities at stations, and it's really very helpful for us to sort of understand the network in a way that you wouldn't see from just a sort of a total aggregate sums and totals and peaks um, that you would see with just totals. And then another example um, is sort of answering a different question. And this was, again, going back to the why are we doing the interesting data work. And this answered the question um, from our bus colleagues. So our bus colleagues said, right, we know you're doing some interesting work with a touch in and a touch out on Oyster, on the tube. And it's, it's interesting and straightforward because you have a tap in and a tap out and those touches um, give you a journey. On the bus, we had a different challenge because um, if you've ridden on our buses, you know you, t you touch on but you don't, you exit without touching off. So if you have no tap on exit, then the question to us was, well, is there a way to understand where our customers are traveling on the bus so that we can plan our bus network and understand our bus customers in the same way that we are understanding journey patterns on the underground network? And so uh, the sort of exciting news is that we could. And so we actually have an algorithm that we run that takes these uh, taps from our Oyster and ticketing system, and we combine it with, uh, so we take taps from the buses, we then look at other taps in the network, and we also know where our buses are, because if you go back to the earlier slide, which shows that we have the data set, we have a very rich data set of bus locations. And we mash that together. And again, we're looking at sort of patterns overall. Um, so you can sort of get an overall inference of where customers are leaving buses and profiles of entries and exits and loading on the bus, which is hugely helpful. Um, it helps us plan our network. It gives us a really sort of multimodal public transport, what we call a matrix, which is basically a tool that helps us understand public transport journeys journeys end to end. Um, and it also helps us with the road network, because one of the fantastic opportunities at, at working for a TFL is the fact we are an integrated transport authority. So not only are we thinking about the public transport network, we're thinking about strategic roads layouts as well. And so this was a tool that we used when we were thinking about our roads modernization program. And so this is where we were designing uh, some of our junctions differently. And we had a number of buses coming in and out of the junctions and a number of buses grouped alongside different stops. And so the questions that we were looking to answer was as well as we redesign these junctions is are there ways that we should improve the customer experience, improve the flow of junctions, and improve how customers are changing from bus to bus or bus to tube um, while they're traveling on the network. And so we used this sort of directly to sort of plan out how we were improving junctions at a number of our locations in London. And then the last example I want to talk about is one I'm, I'm very excited about that we've worked on recently, which was we said, right, we understand on the, uh, on the underground, we have from our Oyster and contactless payment data, we have pattern information about entry and exit taps. Um, but we didn't know within the system how people were traveling. And we said, could we use depersonalized Wi-Fi information um, connection information, not browsing, but con so connection information 
on the network to understand customer movements. And so we did a pilot uh, last year where we said we wanted to try this out. And we said, let's just measure how successful this is. Let's ask ourselves some questions. Could we use this data source to potentially provide better information to customers um, for journey planning or for avoiding congestion? Could we operate and manage our stations better with this new information? Could we plan better for timetables and upgrades? Um, and could we measure footfall? And could we sort of use that as a part of um, our investment in our services to generate additional income? And so these were the questions. And again, going back to why are we doing data, it has to come down to what are your questions and what are you measuring? And so these were the questions that formed the, uh, formed the, the pilot that we ran. And the other fundamental part goes back to the earlier uh, discussion, which is about trust in us and transparency and, and privacy. And so it was absolutely fundamental for us to make sure we were transparent and clear about what we were doing and why. And so we had a, a big campaign of uh, information out on what we were doing. We had posters um, at our stations where we were collecting information and telling customers how they could opt out if they didn't want to participate. And we had information on our website um, and a number of sort of press articles, including in the Metro. We, did a, we have a page in the Metro where we pr provide service information. Um, and we had a whole sort of article in the Metro. And it was crucial and fundamental that we were clear on what we were doing and why. And we followed the guidance from uh, the ICO, in, in, which is the Information Commissioner's Office, in terms of how we sort of take this forward. Um, so what do we find? So we did this data collection, and we found um, that you had more than 500 million probing requests at 54 of the stations and from 5.6 million devices. And so what do we do with this? We took this information and we can look at busy stations and trains. Um, so you could see here you have some sort of trains on the Victoria line and, you could, and we all know, you know, again, going back to the early slides and the profiles, that there were some busy times. But we said, could do we actually use this to identify which particular trains were more crowded at particular times? And it was very exciting to see that, yes, um, there is potential to sort of see when is the busiest. So you could sort of, you could begin to see how it's busy. I mean, it's not particularly busy, you know, between 7.50 and 7.55, but there's this pinch point. And just even between 8.25 and 8.30 or 8.35, it begins to tail off. And you can really see the very sharp peaks in a way that you just don't quite see with these sort of the Oyster and, uh, and contactless payment sort of data from the gates. And then another really interesting finding that we found was we were looking at, uh, this, is, this here is Oxford Circus. And Oxford Circus is a busy station. Um, it's busy, particularly, and it's not surprising, people are coming and going from shopping and from work. And it's busy um, to, at the ticket hall in the evening. And that's what we're sort of seeing um, with this blue is sort of, the, uh, sort of the profile of Oyster. But what we found is that there's a whole hive of activity going on in the morning. That if you were a commuter um, traveling and changing in Oxford Circus in the morning, you would see this. Um, but at the ticket hall level, we never would, we never would pick that up because what, what we're able to sort of measure in a way that was not just sort of anecdotal but actual measurement is the interchange between the Central Line and the Victoria Line and the Bakerloo Line. Very heavily, intensely used in the morning um, and that's what we could sort of pick up. But of course, you know, above ground, it's a lot quieter um, on the street level. And so what we were able to sort of use this data for is to understand in a more precise way what was going on on our network. And then the other things that we did is we looked at sort of customer movements in stations. And so we saw how, uh, the, if you look at sort of Houston station, you look at the different ways customers can travel within a station and the different paths. And that can help us in terms of understanding impact of disruptions, signposting, and how customers are just traveling around the network within a station. And then we could also see it from, sort of station, from station to station and all the different ways that customers can go um, from King's Cross to Waterloo. And beforehand, we were reliant upon surveys. We would sort of hand out paper surveys um, to our customers, usually in November. You might uh, be traveling through a station that we decided to survey, and we'd ask you these questions. Where did you travel from and to? And we get a few of these paths. You know, we got maybe four or five of them, but we certainly weren't getting some of the really sort of unusual sort of paths and patterns that we were picking up when you actually looked at sort of data patterns overall. And so that helps us understand this, the, this whole sort of breadth of travel on our network in a way that we just didn't know before. 
And so, and this is where, you know, again, this is useful for sort of planning on a, uh, planning on a sort of a regular day, but it also helps us understand impacts of disruption. And we can sort of then go back and look at what happens on the network on a disrupted day and work with our controllers and say, you took a decision here, um, and this is the impact. And you can compare what you did in one day versus another day, and it gives the controller a better understanding of the impact of what they're doing. So in cases where you might need to close a station because it's getting crowded, you can see the impact on another station. So we saw that when King's Cross was closed. Um, and you can see the, sort of the buildup of, of, uh, of congestion at Houston and the impact on walk times. And you can sort of see where people divert when they have to divert from one line to another. And these are things that we know from looking with eyes and ears. Um, but this is a way to actually sort of measure it in a much more precise way than you ever could if you're just relying upon um, on your eyes and cameras and CCTV and being on the ground in a station. So this is hugely helpful. And so what next? We published a report um, in the beginning of September, and I would recommend going and downloading it. It goes into some more detail on it. Um, and we want to talk about how we could potentially take this forward on a permanent basis, because we think there's great value in terms of doing this sort of exercise. And so um, we wanted to sort of work with stakeholders and talk to privacy groups in particular about their thoughts on this and how do you move forward from a pilot and how might you change it if you're doing an ongoing collection. And we're thinking technically also as well on how we would change uh, this is some of the techniques about a sort of a data collection because thinking about the vast amounts of data that you're collecting. And then we are thinking about how this can help with understanding footfall volumes at stations um, because we are, you know, we, we reinvest all the money that we earn on the network into improving services. We don't make a profit. So um, our retail units and stations are, are an important source of income as is the poster revenue that we're getting. And so thinking about how footfall data can be helpful here. Um, and I would just sort of recommend, as I said, go to look at our report because um, it was a really exciting project and it was great for us and the team to work on this um, as well. And so just to end up, I just want to sum up what, what are my key takeaways and principles here. So you have to start with the fact that uh, protecting privacy and fundamentally designing the way that you're doing data collection, um, keeping that sort of privacy in, at the front of mind is crucial. And then you just say, why, what, focus on the right questions. So don't start with data. Don't start with just, here's a bunch of data. What can I do with it? Could I do something interesting? Start with, what are you trying to achieve? So um, we work with a sort of a framework that says, as a you know, particular type of sort of person, so it might be as a station, uh, station sort of operator, as a, someone planning timetables for next year, um, someone sort of designing information for customers. And we say, I need. X, not I need a table with this data field, um, but no, what do you need? What do you really need uh, in order to do what? What are you going to do with this information? And so it's about t making a decision. Um, and it's really about the decision and the action you're going to take. And then the other things that we're thinking about is we have a huge opportunity with, op with new infrastructure going in. Um, it's so much easier now to design it so you're collecting data. And it allows you the, sort of the opportunity to sort of design it and collect data from the start. Um, and then the other last bit is to test things, right? Do things as a proof of concepts. Don't big, build big solutions um, to start with without knowing what you want to test and seeing if there's value in it. So that's what we, uh, that's the sort of the takeaway I would, I would leave you all with. Um, so if there's any time for questions, I don't know how we're doing the time. Okay. Um, so happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, is there any mechanism in place to collect, take the consent from the customers in order to analyze their personal data, particularly in terms of contactless payments, because DFL has introduced the contactless payments that means you DFL will collect only part of the information and full information. I'll summarize. Um, so the question was about sort of consent. So uh, the first thing just to keep in mind is that we sort of rely very, very, very heavily on the guidance from the Information Commissioner's Office, and that sort of helps us design what we're doing. Um, consent is important, but it's not. There's, it's broader than just consent because if we are collecting information um, about payment, it's about people sort of paying on the network, and that's why we're collecting the information so people have a right to travel. We do for we have the ability to travel anonymously. 
So um, that's very important to us so that customers who don't want to have a relationship with us can travel on our network and we don't know, we don't know sort of who they are. We're just sort of collecting information uh, in order to process payments. Some customers really want that deep relationship with us and we want to think about how do we support that, but some customers don't. So it's important that we are clear about the data that we're collecting and protecting it and putting in the sort of system protections and also just explaining why we're collecting data. Um, and so that's, that's sort of where that whole sort of piece, piece comes in. So if someone, wa if someone wants to, sort of, to travel on our system, they have to sort of have, you know, have a payment authority to travel and there's a variety of ways that they can do that. Um, and then the analysis of the data and when we're looking for patterns is basically is pseudonymized. We're depersonalizing the sort of analysis on that. So, I mean, the, so, so if you, we don't need, we, we are collecting the data to sort of understand the sort of customer patterns and we, and because it's, you don't have to sort of give full data to us, we sort of limiting, and this is crucial, you only collect the data that you need to collect um, and you are, you, you, that's how you sort of design, design it. Hi, just a quick yeah. one. Um, as you will move into the private space from next year, what would be the impact on your relationship with your customers and the data you hold? I'm sorry, with GDPR? Or which, which, what was your...? Potentially, yeah. as you transform as an organization and you become private, a private organization, isn't it? What would be the impact? We're, we're a public authority. Okay, yeah. right, okay, yeah. at the moment. We're, TFL we're, will not change, T yeah? Yeah. No. Yeah, TFL okay, is, yeah, no, yeah, TFL is a, we report into the mayor uh, and Unless you know something, I don't know. But no, there's TFL is a. <laughs> we are we are a public authority, um, and we we report to the mayor, um, and that's yeah. We are we are a part of the GLA family. <laughs> you mentioned briefly your um, data and privacy team. Mm -hmm. uh, how does how is your broader team, I guess, with data at TFL? How does the team structured, and, and what does it look like? Okay. So what, the way that we do this is we have an information governance team that is purposely separate from my team. So they are the, they're basically part of our general counsel and they are looking at sort of in, the, sort of the policies overall and, and setting guidance and guidelines. And we work very closely with them, but it's helpful to have them as a separate team um, to sort of to have us essentially sort of becomes a little bit of a check and balance internally and ask us really useful questions. So on the privacy impact assessment, we will say this is what we'd like to do and then we'll review it and we'll say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about the minimum amount of information you need to collect to get the outcome you need? And that's hugely helpful. Within my team, I do have a data governance manager from a technical perspective looking at how we implement the, sort of the, the, sort of the technical, uh, the policy and then how do you implement it technically. And so that governance manager um, is sort of basically so sort of that translation from a policy to actually how do we do it in practice. Hi there. Um, I was wondering, your collaboration with other transport Bodies, so that could be first great Western or whatever, and also international mm -hmm. ones like so Singapore transport systems. So I've traveled. I'm just wondering how you share information and how you improve your services based off that. Really. Okay, so we have so starting within sort of the London context, um, we have a sharing of information with the train operating companies because if you use your Oyster card or contactless payment card across London, we are providing the payment platform. So there is a level of, of financial and statistical information that we share um, with, so within the train operating companies. So that, that, and actually just to do that requires a lot of energy and effort and focus because um, there's billions of in, in revenue that we're talking about, so you need to make sure that we're all sort of, you know, working on this closely and, and, and precisely. So then you think about, so that's a financial transactional, but then you think about what are the opportunities for sharing information and sharing patterns and information and how to do the, the sort of data science work. And so that is a mix. So with some, some cities, many of them come and talk to me often and, and, and talk about our approach. Um, and some of them, you know, some of it's a longer conversation and an ongoing. Some of them are just a come and we're, I'm here for the, I'm here for a visit for the day. Tell me what you do. So it's a, it's a range. But in terms of the methodologies and our, our focus on how do we focus on the questions, we are, we are very keen to share um, how what our overall approach to sort of using data and information. And so we do that within the UK, and we also do that um, with other cities. So um, we did have a, so a memorandum of understanding with Singapore. 
um, for a while, and we did share, they shared with us as well, so when we were thinking about our next generation ticketing system, they gave us some thoughts in terms of how we were doing, uh, how we were approaching it and as well, and then of course as we've done some of our data work, we continue to talk back to them and many other cities um, over the world. Um, and then we also do, as I mentioned, do sharing with universities, so if they have a research question that is of interest to us, we have, we can share pseudonymized data sets with them, limited data, um, for to answer a question on our behalf. And so the work on the bus uh, prediction about where people were leaving the bus, the inference model, that came out of a partnership with MIT, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks for the fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. It was very, very inspiring. Thanks. Um, a quick question. Can you list some of the most important tips that um, the information um, the ICO uh, gave you for the Wi-Fi project? I mean, we, so I would say there have some guidance documents that we read through very carefully, and they're all on the website, and it's worth really reading through them from a technical point of view. From a going forward point of view, you know, being very transparent and in talking to our customers. And so before we started, we actually had some focus groups with some customers to talk about um, what we were proposing and to sort of get their, th get their thinking and that helped shape things as well. And so get that was also something that was sort of helpful. Um, and so it's a combination of understanding technical best practice and it's also, but it's really the approach of just wanting to make sure that we're very transparent about it um, and clear about what we're doing and why and the benefit. Um, and certainly from our customer research, our customers, when, you, when they could see where this might be useful um, as a tangible benefit for getting either information directly to customers about the network or planning a, in, t tomorrow a service better or responding to disruption, that very sort of concrete, oh, I see how this would be helpful, um, was, was something that was well received and has been well received by our customers in seeing the results of the trial. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you, Laura. Well, thank you.